Good morning. My name is Dave Waxy, and I'm a federal magistrate judge in the District of Kansas. And I want to welcome you here this morning. And if you haven't already noticed, you may notice that this is being audio taped and video taped by Kansas Public Radio for their later use, as well as it'll be available on our website. So if they do crowd shots, maybe you can find your face there. The thing I want to tar start with is to explain why this foundation exists that's putting on your program today. It all starts back in the 1994 time frame when I was, before I was a judge, I was general counsel of the local ACLU affiliate. And we got a call from several high school students asking if they could meet with us about some violations of their First Amendment rights. So we met with them and agreed that their rights had been violated. And what had happened is that several gay rights groups had donated books to the local libraries all across the metropolitan area. And the Olathe Library said when they told the superintendent that one book was really good and the other one wasn't too good. And the superintendent said, well, how do you know it's good? And she said, well, we already have it in our library. So that caused a big controversy, and the school board met, and they voted to remove the book from the library. And there had already been a case in the United States Supreme Court finding that kind of behavior unconstitutional. So we filed suit, and the case finally went to trial in 1995. Judge Van Beber, who's now deceased, was the trial judge, and it was really one of those really fun trials because the school board members when testifying kept kind of changing the story a little bit on why they'd voted and one of the famous lines from that trial that I think helped us win is one of the school board members said in addition to voting to remove it because it was educationally unsuitable she didn't think high school students should read fiction and Judge Van Beber leaned over his bench and said, ma'am, don't you ever read for pleasure? And she said, yes, but high school students shouldn't. So he found that high school students had a right to read for pleasure. And so Annie on My Mind, which is the story of two high school girls who fall in love, was put back in the school libraries in Olathe. And the other thing Judge Van Beber did is awarded us our attorney's fees, and so after a heated battle about attorney's fees, we got an award that had to be taken to the Tenth Circuit because it was a little too low for our perspective. The Tenth Circuit agreed it was too low and increased our fees, and with those fees, we now have the money to create the foundation. So my partner, Gene Balloon, who helped me try that case will now take you through the next steps. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, I used to call him Dave before he came, became a judge, but we were law partners for many years. And as Judge Waxy indicated, at the conclusion of the trial, when Judge Van Beber found that the students' First Amendment rights had been infringed upon, he awarded the attorney's fees, which uh, we ultimately determined the amount. Uh, after uh, we were awarded the attorney's fees, uh, our firm donated the fees together with some additional money to create the First Amendment Foundation. The mission of the First Amendment Foundation is to help uh, high school students better understand the Constitution, how it works, the way it affects our daily lives, and uh, their individual rights under that magnificent document. To uh, carry out this mission, uh, we've had a variety of different projects. For example, some years we've had banned books uh, writing contests at the high school whereby students could read a banned book, uh, write an essay, and win a cash prize. Uh, last year, we uh, had uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who honored us uh, with her presentation 
here at uh, this program. We have another outstanding program for you today with Professor Tribe from Harvard University. When uh, Dave and I were getting the case ready for trial, we uh, challenged the students who were involved to be witnesses in the federal court. And they readily accepted and were outstanding students in advocating for their First Amendment rights. We wanted to add something more. And so on the off chance that Nancy Garden, the author of Annie on My Mind, would appear as a witness, I called her at her home in Boston, asked her if she would do so, and she jumped at the chance to come to Kansas City and be a witness. She testified in federal court and was an incredible witness in defense not only of the literary quality of her award-winning book, uh, and uh, Annie on My Mind had won many awards, but also in defense of students. And all her life, Nancy Garden had been a defender of students' rights and advocated uh, for children. She, uh, as I indicated, was an outstanding witness at that trial. The courtroom was spellbound during her testimony. Fortunately, Nancy was able to be with us last year for the Justice O'Connor program. But uh, sadly, several months ago, uh, Nancy Garden unexpectedly died. We, we lost a great author. Uh, we lost an advocate for young people, and most of all, we lost a warm, caring human being. So we're dedicating this program this morning to Nancy Garden. Now my law partner, Tristan Duncan, who has worked on a number of important cases with Professor Tribe, will introduce our program. Thank you. I am honored to introduce Professor Lawrence Tribe and Teresa Wynn Roseboro. Professor Tribe was born in Shanghai, China to Russian Jewish refugees shortly before Pearl Harbor. His father was incarcerated in a Japanese prison camp until the end of the war. Professor Tribe came to San Francisco with his parents and a baby brother when he was not yet six. He spoke only Russian until he was eight and attended public schools. But by 16, he had entered Harvard College on the full scholarship, the first member of his family to attend college. He graduated summa cum laude in mathematics in 1962, and then went to Harvard Law School where he graduated magna cum laude in 1966. Professor Tribe clerked at the California Supreme Court and then the United States Supreme Court. After his judicial clerkships, he became a professor at Harvard Law School, where he has taught for nearly 45 years. He has won the Best Teacher Award and for the past 10 years has held the title of university professor, Harvard's highest academic honor and one bestowed on less than 75 scholars in all of Harvard's history. He has written 115 books and articles helped write the constitutions of South Africa and the Czech Republic, and has argued three dozen cases in the United States Supreme Court, winning almost two-thirds of all his appellate cases. Professor Tribe has also received 11 honorary degrees. His students have included President Barack Obama, Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan, and Chief Justice John Roberts, as well as many other federal judges, senators, and members of Congress. His treatise, American Constitutional Law, is the most frequently cited legal text and was quoted most recently in the Supreme Court by Justice Scalia just this past term. We also are honored to have with us Teresa Wynn Roseboro. Ms. Roseboro is the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary for the Home Depot. Ms. Roseboro has over 25 years of legal experience, having served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for the United States Department of Justice, 
where she has provided legal counsel to the White House. She also clerked for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Ms. Roseboro earned her undergraduate degree from the University of uh, Virginia, a master's degree in education from Boston University, and a law degree with high honors from the University of North Carolina, where she was editor-in-chief of the Law Review. Ms. Roseboro was named one of the 25 most influential black women in business by the Network Journal and one of America's top black attorneys by Black Enterprise. Despite all of this success, Ms. Roseboro says she is not perfect. At another presentation honoring her many achievements, she had this to say. A few disclosures about who I am as opposed to what I have done. I do not cook. I cannot sing. It sometimes takes me hours to decide what to wear. My weight fluctuates, and I am always just a few drops of rain away from a bad hair day. I play golf badly. I'm a geek. I love the law, and I absolutely love being a lawyer. We are thrilled Ms. Roseboro is here with us today to talk with Professor Tribe and you about their mutual love for education and American constitutional law. But before welcoming them to the stage, I want to say a few words about how this morning's program will go. Professor Tribe first will come out and give you a few introductory remarks. He then will be joined on stage by Professor Ms. Roseboro, who will explore with him some of the exciting cases he has handled at the Supreme Court and discuss his new book, Uncertain Justice, which is about the Constitution and our current Supreme Court. They then will open the conversation up to the audience for questions. So students, please be thinking of the questions you would like to ask Professor uh, Tribe and Ms. Roseboro, because they want to hear from you and receive your input. Now please join me in getting a warm welcome to Professor Lawrence Tribe. Thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> thank you all very much, and, and thank you, Tristan. Marking uh, important anniversaries is a staple of American life. And in this year, 2014, in this place, Topeka, Kansas. Actually, are we in Topeka or Kansas City? Topeka. We're marking such a milestone. This is the 60th anniversary of the most important Supreme Court decision of the 20th century, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. And we are just an hour from Kansas City, uh, which Huffington Post just rated the hippest city in America. And that was even before the Royals made it to the ALC series by beating the Angels on Sunday. Go Royals. I'm, I'm, I must confess, I, I was a Red Sox fan, but I'm a Royals fan for the time being. Uh, we're honored also to have with us in the audience Cheryl Brown Henderson, whose dad was Oliver Brown, one of the kids on whose behalf the great Thorgood Marshall brought the lawsuit to end forced separation of the races in public schools. The landmark 1954 ruling in Brown versus Board of Education, which overturned the infamous separate but equal doctrine of Plessy versus Ferguson decided nearly 60 years earlier was the culmination of a long and often deadly struggle. Violent conflict between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces in what came to be known as Bleeding Kansas preceded the admission of Kansas to the Union in January 1861, shortly before Lincoln became president that March and just four years after the Supreme Court in Dred Scott versus Sanford overturned the Missouri Compromise, enacted the year before Missouri gained statehood as a slave state in 1821. The ties between Kansas and Massachusetts date to those bloody early days. The admission of Kansas to the Union as a free state resulted largely from the daring of Kansas abolitionists but it got a major boost from the work of Massachusetts abolitionists like the Lawrence brothers, Amos and William, 
They were among the leading smugglers of guns and money to their abolitionist allies in towns like Lawrence, Kansas, their namesake, which was to be a place where every former slave could breathe free. They shared Lincoln's conviction that our nation could not long endure half slave and half free. In the end, our nation opted for freedom, but only after more than half a million of us had been killed in the war to save the Union, a war in which Kansas suffered more fatalities than any other Union state. Freedom and equality were not won quickly. A racial caste system that subjected African Americans to constant indignity and even beatings and lynchings persisted throughout southern and border states from the late 1870s until well into the 20th century. Changes in the law do not always translate immediately into changes in life. For example, several years after Brown v. Board of Education, the school board of Little Rock, Arkansas, voted to defy the orders of the federal district court that had told Little Rock it had to comply with the Supreme Court's desegregation ruling. The state's governor, Orville Faubus, called out the Arkansas National Guard backed by an angry mob to bar the entry of black students to Central High. But President Dwight Eisenhower, who grew up in Abilene, Kansas, was determined to preserve the rule of law and to secure equal justice. So he mobilized the 101st Airborne Division, which had performed heroically in Normandy under his direction as Supreme Allied Commander for Europe, to come to Little Rock with 52 planes carrying 1,000 troops. The governor stood down and the black kids were escorted into Central High. One of them wrote in her diary, for the first time in my life, I feel like an American citizen. What the Supreme Court does and what it fails to do makes a huge difference in part by issuing written opinions that remind the nation of its founding ideals, and in part by commanding compliance. But as you know, the judicial branch doesn't have its own enforcement arm. It depends on the executive branch to back up its orders. Thankfully, every modern president has done just that, even when the president has been the object of those orders. So when the Supreme Court told President Harry Truman in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer in 1952 that he had violated the Constitution when he took over the nation's steel mills to keep industrial peace during the Korean War, Truman instantly turned the keys to the steel mills over to their owners. When the Supreme Court told President Richard Nixon in 1974 in United States versus Nixon to turn over the Watergate tapes that doomed his presidency, he complied at once. When the Supreme Court in Ham D. V. Rumsfeld told President George W. Bush in 2004 that he could not detain American citizens indefinitely even during a war against terrorists without according the detainees due process of law including a chance to contest the factual basis for their detention before a neutral decision maker, the president complied as he did in Rasul v. Bush decided the same day, which told the president that the executive branch must explain and defend in court the detention of enemy soldiers at Guantanamo, Cuba. The Supreme Court's decisions matter because they reshape not just how our government can operate, but the way we live. From where and with whom we can go to school, to whom we can date or marry, to how we can defend ourselves against home intruders and street muggings, to what we are free to say or write or draw in or out of school, to when the police can search through the contents of our smartphones. You'll all be receiving a copy of my latest book, a book that I co-authored with a great recent student of mine, Joshua Matz. I think reading that book, Uncertain Justice, the Roberts Court and the Constitution, 
will help you understand all of that a lot better and bring it to life. Last year was the 50th anniversary of another great decision, Gideon versus Wainwright, which began when a drifter named Clarence Earl Gideon with only an eighth grade education, not exactly an AP student, found himself falsely accused of breaking into a pool hall with intent to steal some money from the cash register. To bring the facts home, just imagine yourself being arrested for something you didn't do at a Starbucks or at an internet cafe and being put on trial, threatened with years of imprisonment. Gideon asked the trial judge to appoint a lawyer to defend him because he had no money to hire a lawyer of his own and he couldn't get any help from his mom and dad having run away from home. The judge said no, because back in 1942, in a case called Betts versus Brady, the Supreme Court had held that the Constitution's 14th Amendment, enacted soon after the Civil War, doesn't give people accused of crime an automatic right to a lawyer unless the state is trying to kill them, that is, to give them the death penalty. Due process of law, which is demanded of the states by the 14th Amendment, just as it is demanded of the federal government by the Fifth Amendment, hadn't necessarily included a right to counsel, much less a right to counsel paid for by the state. Gideon had no clue how to introduce evidence of his innocence or how to go about cross-examining the state's witnesses to poke holes in their phony story. So he was, of course, convicted. He was sentenced to five years in prison. Now, most people who lose a case in a state trial court appeal right up through the state's appellate courts. But Gideon didn't know the rules for filing state court appeals. He made a guess, I think he was correct, that the Florida Supreme Court would have ruled against him anyway, even if he were to learn those rules. So he decided to skip an appeal and just file a handwritten petition for something called a writ of habeas corpus with the Florida Supreme Court. Such a writ is an order requiring your jailer to come into court to explain why you are being imprisoned. The writ of habeas corpus has long been called the great writ. It's a person's last line of defense against tyrannical imprisonment, a remedy dating back centuries to the laws of England. And in the early 1960s, the rules for seeking that kind of order were relatively loose. So Gideon hoped to use his habeas corpus petition to persuade the Florida courts to overrule Betts v. Brady. After all, the due process clause applies to all state deprivations of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, not just state deprivations of life. Gideon's argument wasn't bad in the abstract, but no lower court, state or federal, can overturn a decision of the US Supreme Court to which the Constitution gives the last word on questions of federal law, including the law of the federal Constitution. Gideon, who had little formal education but was plenty bright and stayed up nights reading law books, overestimated what a state court could do when he wrote a letter to the Florida Supreme Court asking it to issue a writ of habeas corpus so he could contest his imprisonment by challenging what the US Supreme Court had done back in 1942. The state's highest court refused, but Gideon was nothing if not persistent. He didn't give up. He decided to scribble a handwritten petition for certiorari, the term for a request to the US Supreme Court asking it to hear your case after every lower court has turned you down. And he mailed it to the Supreme Court in Washington. The other prisoners helped him raise the money for the stamps. And even though Gideon's cert petition, as it is called for short, was filed in handwriting and didn't look nearly as impressive as the formally printed petitions of which the court receives many thousands every year, the Supreme Court's rules permit someone who is too poor to afford printing costs to submit what is called a pauper's petition. Now it takes four justices out of nine to hear a case, 
and less than 90 cases are heard in a typical year out of roughly 9,000 requests from all around the country filed by petitioners who have lost cases either in the highest court of one of the states or in one of the U.S. Federal Circuit Courts of Appeals. Each Supreme Court justice gets to hire several super smart recent law school graduates to help screen petitions and draft opinions. Gideon's cert petition caught the eye of an attentive law clerk for one of the justices. And that law clerk persuaded his justice that the court should hear Gideon's case. Now, there was no conflict among the lower courts on the question Gideon presented, nor did the decision Gideon asked the Supreme Court to review conflict with any Supreme Court decision. Those are the usual reasons for the court to grant cert. You all know that the court just yesterday refused, even though both sides in the seven cases involving same-sex marriage, urged the court to hear the case and decide it once and for all for the country. The court didn't take the cases. There was no conflict in the courts below. There was no conflict with the decision of the Supreme Court. The Supremes are undoubtedly waiting until one circuit court finally rules the other way. But Gideon's case nonetheless seemed important enough to at least four of the justices that the court agreed to hear him out. It appointed a prominent lawyer named Abe Fortas from a big DC law firm. Abe Fortas was later a justice himself. It appointed Fortas to represent Gideon in briefing and arguing his case. Now here's an irony for you. A law that Congress had enacted years earlier provided for such publicly funded representation in the Supreme Court, even though the Constitution had not yet been interpreted to provide publicly funded representation for the Gideons of the world at the trial level where it matters most, unless they face the death penalty. So the court heard oral argument with Fortas representing Gideon and Florida's attorney general representing the state's jail warden. The justices debated the case within their marble palace and they decided unanimously in a few months to overturn the court's prior ruling in Betts versus Brady. The new opinion, Gideon v. Wainwright, was written by a former Alabama senator named Hugo Black, a great justice appointed in 1937, who had written a dissent for three justices back in the Betts case. Dissents sometimes become majorities. In constitutional cases, the principle that's called stare decisis meaning stick by the prior decision, can always be overridden if the court concludes that its prior decision was clearly wrong in light of changed facts or new understandings of the Constitution's meaning, which is, of course, what also happened when Brown v. Board overruled Plessy v. Ferguson. Justice Black's opinion for the court in Gideon held that the Sixth Amendment right to the assistance of counsel for an accused person's defense was incorporated into the 14th Amendment's right to due process of law, which is just a fancy way of saying that due process of law would henceforth include against the states what the Sixth Amendment included against the federal government. The Bill of Rights itself, the Constitution's first 10 amendments, applies only to the federal government. That's a proposition the Supreme Court had established back in 1833 in a case called Barron v. Baltimore, a case that's never been overruled. But the court held in Palco versus Connecticut in 1937 that those provisions of the Bill of Rights that protect fundamental rights are incorporated against the states through the 14th Amendment's due process clause. And the Supreme Court in the Gideon case concluded that the right to counsel was among those fundamental rights because it was essential to a fair trial in which every defendant stands equal before the law. And the court concluded that it was just illogical and unconstitutional to limit that right to cases that happened to involve the death penalty. So the Supreme Court having ruled for Gideon, didn't just set him free, it sent the case back to the Florida courts. 
where the prosecutor decided to put poor old Gideon on trial again. See, the Supreme Court has interpreted the double jeopardy clause of the Fifth Amendment. That was the clause that Palco versus Connecticut incorporated against the states. It interpreted it to permit any level of government to try a person over and over again until he's either acquitted or convicted. If there's a mistrial, usually you can have a retrial. And if you appeal your conviction, the court reasons you're waiving the right not to be retried. This time, the trial judge, who was of course bound by what the Supreme Court had just held in Gideon v. Wainwright, had to grant Gideon's request for a public defender. And that public defender quickly showed that the prosecution's case was a pile of, you know what, a fabric of lies, let us say. The story has a happy ending, guided by a defense lawyer who knew how to poke holes in the state's phony case, the jury acquitted Clarence Earl Gideon, who became a hero in the history of American justice because his unwillingness to give up led to the decision that today protects all of you and me, all of us, from having ever to face a powerful government without at least a minimally competent legal defense, whether we're rich or poor. And the difference that a competent lawyer can make and did make in helping Gideon achieve justice also makes that story a useful reminder of how important capable lawyers can be in serving the cause of justice. Although I would be the first to admit that law and justice are not always the same thing. And that lawyers who opt to serve as hired guns for injustice are part of the picture too. To me, the tale of Clarence Earl Gideon has always been an inspiring reminder of how one person can make a lasting difference and of how the Supreme Court, when it's at its best, can live up to the words chiseled in marble right above its majestic entrance equal justice under law. Go Royals. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. It, it's, now, it's, it's now my pleasure and privilege to invite my really good friend, one of truly the greatest lawyers in America, Teresa Wynne Roseborough up to the stage uh, to engage in a conversation with me before taking some of your questions. Teresa. Thanks. Well, Larry, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for inviting me to join you here. Thanks to all of you for being here uh, today. We're really looking forward to your uh, questions uh, later, so start thinking about the questions you would like to ask Professor Tribe. I was, the story about Clarence Gideon is so uh, compelling and so rich that he worked so hard not just to achieve a victory for himself, but to make law that makes all of us mm -hmm. safer when we confront uh, the courts and, and justice. But criminal trials also involve the rights of other people, victims, uh, the families of victims, and I know you as a lawyer had an opportunity to work on a case that had to do with the rights of victims to see government at work, to be involved in trial and not be excluded from it. Do you mind sharing a few words no, about that? I, I'd love to. Actually, it was my first Supreme Court argument. And when I was asked to do it, the, uh, the Richmond newspapers who asked me to represent them just didn't ask me whether I'd ever argued a case before. I'm glad they didn't. <laughs> uh, because if I had said, no, this is going to be my first time out, I'm not sure I would have gotten to do it. This was a, a, just to make it short, this was a case where this guy was on trial for murdering a woman and the trial kept be going over and over again because as I explained, double jeopardy doesn't really prevent you from going at it a few times. And one time there was a mistrial, another time his conviction was reversed, but eventually, and his, his family got to see those trials and it was really a source of comfort to them, but then, uh, 
there was some kind of sweet deal made between the trial judge, the prosecutor, and the accused, saying, this time we're going to do it in the dark, like, like this room, but without the Klieg lights. No presence of the victim. The, the, the poor murdered woman's kids couldn't be there. The press, the public couldn't be there. We're going to just do this private-like. And the Richmond newspapers were outraged, but the ones who really were hurt were the, were the family. And it didn't take more than an hour for the judge to say, I declare the defendant innocent. Wow. I mean, you know, in the dark, this special deal, and none of us could know whether the system of justice was working. The Richmond newspapers felt strongly enough about it that they wanted to hire somebody, so they ended up asking me, and I did it on a pro bono basis. I do about half my cases without any, any charge. Um, so I can charge big corporations like Home Depot <laughs> a lot of money when I do those cases. Uh, no, Worth actually, it's the other way around. I charge Home <laughs> Depot so I can do the ones pro bono. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I argued the case. And um, to make a pretty long story short, we won eight, uh, eight to one. The Supreme Court decided that the press and the public have a right to watch trials. And one of the cool things, talking about the way these cases, these living cases, can bring history into the picture. The judge gave only one excuse for excluding the press and the public. He said, this courtroom is just not suitable for the public to attend. Now, it was in Hanover County, Virginia. It was an old courthouse. And I did some research in the National, um, in the National Gallery of Art. And it turned out there was this big painting hanging in the National Gallery that showed Patrick Henry, the famous Patrick Henry, delivering an oration to a crowded courtroom with people sort of hanging from the rafters, and it was this very courtroom. So I included that in the appendix to the brief to basically show what a crock it was uh, to say <laughs> that this courtroom could not accommodate the public. But the principle that was established in that case forever is that basically in criminal trials, and pretty clearly in civil trials as well, you can't just exclude the press and the public. You may be able, if it's a national security issue, to ask them to leave for half an hour or 10 minutes or something. But witnesses, even if they would rather testify in private, have to face the public. Yes. So I know it was great to make that precedent that courtrooms have to be open places and can't do their work in secret. But was it frustrating that for the family for them, this case was really over. They yeah. were never going to get to see the process by which the person accused of murdering their family member got acquitted. It was frustrating. Uh, you know, and if the family had gone to court, they wouldn't have been able to get what the judges call standing because they no longer had a stake in the outcome. But at least the Richmond newspapers would be guaranteed that they could cover the next trial. It was frustrating for me because, honestly, my strongest personal motivation was a sense of outrage on behalf of the family. Sometimes you can't get everything. I mean, you can't turn back the clock. Time moves on. But at least the principle was established. And so I was really glad I did the case. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about two criminal uh, environments, two cases where a criminal trial was the, the setting in which law was made, a constitutional rule, if you will, uh, one that everyone's entitled to a lawyer, and second, that courtrooms have to be open, but that's not always the venue for the making of constitutional rules. And you told me a great story of a case that actually began when a student raised a hand in your classroom to ask yeah. a question. Well, that's sort of one of, my, one of my favorites. It was in the early 1980s, and I was teaching the same course that I had taught to Barack Obama and John Roberts, the Chief Justice, and the course changes all the time because the law changes, I change my views, you rethink things. And I'd get bored if I taught the same thing every year. But one thing stayed the same. And that was the principle that under our system of government, unlike you know, what ISIS wants to set up, you don't have religion and government authority in the same hands. The government can't turn over the power of regulating how old you have to be before you can drive or drink or whether you can serve liquor. Uh, can't hand that over to a church. And I just explained that. And this kid near the front row, his name is Ira. Ira is still a friend of mine. A lot of my former students are still friends. Ira raises his hand and says, but, uh, but Professor Tribe, he now calls me, of course, Larry, but Professor Tribe, if government can't give government, 
can't give regulatory power to churches, how come I can't have a beer with my lunch at Grendel's Den? Grendel's Den is this famous old restaurant in Harvard Square. At, at first I said, maybe you're not old enough? And he said, no, 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 I'm old enough. He was an older student. And he said, what has this got to do with church and state? He said, well, actually, right near Grendel's Den, there's the Holy uh, Roman Armenian, no, the Holy Armenian Catholic Church. And under a Massachusetts law, churches get a veto over liquor licenses within a 500-foot radius. It's like a bombing range. <laughs> and they could pick out who can and who can't get a liquor license. And Ira tells me, my cousin Herbie, who came over here from Eastern Europe to escape the tyranny of religion, uh, can't stand the idea that unless he gives basically a bribe to this church, he's not going to be able to survive economically. Because in Harvard Square, if you don't have a liquor license, you can't exist as a restaurant. And I said, you've got to be kidding. There's a law that gives them that power. And he said, yep. So I worked with this student, worked up a lawsuit. We filed a suit in federal court against the State Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission, which is the one that administers the law and which allowed the church to exercise a veto over Grendel's Den's liquor license. Uh, we won in the federal district court, then the state appealed to the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, the New England Circuit, including also Puerto Rico. And then we asked the full First Circuit to review the case, it's called review on bank, meaning all you guys. And the full <laughs> First Circle, Circuit, not just a panel of three, reviewed the case and then ruled in our favor. And then the Attorney General of Massachusetts, representing the Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission, went to the US Supreme Court. And I argued it. This was another one of these pro bono cases. Um, and it was a really enjoyable argument. There was a little 13-year-old girl there that was Herbie, uh, Herbie, the owner of the restaurant, her daughter. She now owns the restaurant, which is why I can get free lunch and beer for myself and all my students <laughs> anytime I go there because they're in business because of that. Actually, this reminds me of one of my favorite mm -hmm. cartoons, if I could just tell you. Yeah. It, it's a ship. It looks like the Mayflower, and there's this dude who looks like a pilgrim pointing to the horizon, and he's saying to his companion, um, my immediate goal is religious freedom, but my long-term objective is to go into real estate. <laughs> and I guess for Herbie it was, my long-term objective is to have a restaurant with a liquor license. <laughs> so I guess they won and uh, got their license after all. So uh, we're here in front of this great uh, crowd of students and you've talked about the case that was uh, inspired by a, co a question from a student. Uh, you talked about your relationship with Joshua who is co-author on the book. Um, maybe you could say a little bit about the free speech rights of students in public schools. Yeah, I mean, those, those rights are theoretically pretty strong. The Supreme Court back in um, the late 60s, 1969, in a case called Tinker uh, against Des Moines School District, said that you guys don't leave your First Amendment rights at the schoolhouse door. That is, you have a right to express your opinions. That case involved kids during the Vietnam War wearing black armbands peacefully to protest the war. And the court laid down a standard saying, if you're expressing your views, but you don't substantially disrupt the educational process, the school can't suspend you or punish you for doing that. That was the theory. But then in a series of cases starting in the late 80s and going right through the current decade, the Supreme Court has unfortunately, in my view, cut back on those rights when the case involves anything remotely related to sex or drugs. I mean, for example, there was this case um, called Bethel School District against Frazier, where one student named Matt Frazier nominated another for student body office and made a nominating speech that was a little bit, you know, a little off color. He said, uh, he said my, my nominee is firm on all issues. He's firm in his pants. And, Students, you know, the students kind of went slightly ballistic, but the one who went really ballistic was the principal. <laughs> she suspended poor old Matt Frazier for his tastelessness, said he was insulting the girls in the audience, uh, that this was just unacceptable, and the Supreme Court went along. 
just because of the sexual innuendo. And then in another case um, called Hazelwood against Kuhlmeier in 1988, there was a school newspaper and there was just some mention of teenage pregnancy. They took care to keep private the names of the girls involved and yet this paper was censored and it was discontinued and the Supreme Court agreed. There was a, a final case in 2007, sort of a funny one about vaguely about drugs. It was called Morse v. Frederick and there was a kid in a school sponsored uh, event who unfurled this huge 18 foot banner which said bong hits for Jesus. <laughs> you know. And not having perhaps the sense of humor of this audience, the school said this guy is advocating illegal drug use in school. Now, that's not what he was doing. I mean, I don't know what he was doing. He, he, <laughs> he, he might have been saying that Jesus was a hippie who was very spiritual. He might have just been saying, you know, occasionally I take a hit from a bong. That's <laughs> terrible. Um, and he might have been saying that he inhaled. But whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever he was saying, clearly the school was not going to tolerate it and the U.S. Supreme Court uh, was not either. There were some dissenting justices who said, you know, this may seem funny, but it really means that any time a student advocates legalizing the medical use of some substance like marijuana, that student is taking a risk. There may be a terrible chilling effect. We need the opinions of the young in order to be a meaningfully open society. Uh, and I think that dissent was right. One of the uh, chapters in your books, Fox talks about the recent evolution of focus on gun rights. Um, but it strikes me that way back in 2000, you um, expressed the viewpoint that the Second Amendment needed to be taken seriously as legislators and policymakers decided on restrictions on uh, the rights of individual gun owners. Uh, yeah. How did that go over way back 14 well, years ago? I'm sort of a liberal, as you might be able to tell. <laughs> Um, but I actually take the Constitution very seriously. And even though most liberals look at the Second Amendment, which says, you know, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the survival of a free state, comma, the right to bear, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They didn't really take the latter part seriously. They said this is about the old-fashioned state militia. And therefore, gun control is fine. Now, I agreed with their bottom line. I think the Second Amendment, taken seriously, still leaves a lot of room for gun safety measures, for uh, background checks, for all kinds of things. And that's what the court has finally held in 2008 and 2010. But when I came out with the view in a book that I wrote in 2000 that the Second Amendment does protect, to some degree, the individual's right to defend herself with a gun, my liberal friends said I had, you know, just abandoned them or whatever. And there, there was actually a story on the front page of the New York Times, leading liberal law professor from Harvard takes Second Amendment seriously. Um, <laughs> and I got a call when I got to my office that day from the then head of the National Rifle Association, Charlton Heston. You all know who that guy is? You've, heard, you've seen Planet of the Apes? The, the, the first one, he wasn't not in the Dawn. more recent ones. He wasn't in Dawn of Planet of the Apes, but he was in the first one. Anyway, so he calls me and he says, now that I realize we're on the same side, and I thought, oops, <laughs> we're not necessarily on the same side. I've got a plane waiting at Logan Airport and a nice island we can go and plot together. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I'm not sure we agree on all of this. Uh, but I did like Planet of the Apes. <laughs> and I never heard from him again. <laughs> Another topic that you explore in your book is the concept of personal privacy and our evolving sense of personal uh, privacy. How do you think the Roberts Court has done with issues of privacy in this age of uh, smartphones and mm -hmm. social media? I think it's been terrific. I mean, the most recent decision involves your cell phone. And the U.S. government and the government of California were taking the position um, in the U.S. Supreme Court that if you happen to be stopped for driving without a seatbelt or crossing against a red light or anything, and if you're legally stopped and you happen to have your cell phone with you, and of course, who doesn't? I mean, you all, always got your cell phone. That's now a piece of the human anatomy. <laughs> and 
that then it can be searched. And when you search a phone that's connected to the cloud, they get your whole life. And the US Supreme Court unanimously agreed that that's not right. That because the cell phone contains so much information, it's not just like a, you know, a piece of paper in your pocket, it can't automatically be searched without a warrant. I thought that was great. There was an earlier decision that I thought was also uh, correct by the uh, Roberts Court back in 2012 that involved GPS tracking of a guy who was suspected of some crime, but they didn't have enough on him in order to get a warrant or anything. They just thought, we'll follow him around. It was the FBI. And they stuck a GPS under uh, his, Jeep his Jeep Cherokee and followed him around for a month. And they said, that's not a search because where he went was purely public, even though you can put together a profile if you know where everybody has been for a whole month, that's pretty damn intimate. I mean, he, he went to see his girlfriend, he went to see a shrink, he went to see a lawyer, then he went to be stopped at this, this place, that place, then he went to see a doctor. You can get quite a profile. At, at the very beginning of the argument, and this will give you the flavor of why the Supreme Court actually has oral arguments and doesn't just read formal briefs that are submitted by the parties. Beginning of the oral argument, Chief Justice Roberts, who was a very clever student of mine back in the day, sort of scratching his head and he says, do you mean to say, Mr. Dreeben, there's this guy, Michael Dreeben, who was representing the United States of America, that without any warrant, they could just put a GPS under my car and follow me around for a month? Any of us? And the courtroom was silent. Michael Dreeben, what, what was he going to say? No, Your Excellency, you are above the law. <laughs> he couldn't say that. He had to say, yep, yep, we could follow you around. And you could just hear the, the government losing the case as the air went out of the room. <laughs> I think the court has done pretty well with, with issues of technology and privacy. Oh, that's great. Well, it's time to turn to some Q&A from the audience. If we could bring the lights up just a little bit. There's a microphone in the back of the room here that we would ask uh, anybody who has a question uh, to uh, come to. And I know we have a student keyed up for our first question. I just would love to take the, a moment to mention, uh, Professor Tribe, that <laughs> I loved reading your book. And I loved it because even though I am personally a geek and, and love the law and love uh, legal terminology, you really wrote a book that anybody can read and enjoy without having to be a lawyer and really walk away understanding how the court reached different decisions. Well, thank you have you. to be really I, that's, that pleased was, by the reviews you're getting. For it. Yeah, and one of my ambitions in writing it was not to write it just for lawyers, because lawyers often use a specialized language, which hides the fact that they often don't know what they're talking about. Um, <laughs> you know, you can sound very erudite if you use all kinds of Latin terms and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but with my favorite student at the time, who was also the chief teaching fellow in a course that I taught to Harvard undergraduates, I decided it would be great to write a book taking advantage of the 40 or more years that I've been studying and thinking about this stuff and arguing in the court to really try to explain how most of the stereotypes that you read about, these guys are on the right, those are on the left, they're all oversimplified. They're just caricatures. You really can get a better sense of what's going on if you take seriously what the justice is right to explain their decisions. And you might find yourself persuaded of something that you originally thought was wrong. Or even if you thought it was right, you might have a better feel about why it's right. And I, I think because the court makes so much difference in our lives, it's about time that all of the people, and not just an elite little layer of lawyers, think hard and become familiar with it. So I'm hoping that you guys, and I'm glad that you're all, I'm really grateful to the First Amendment Foundation uh, that it's set up this event and that it's giving each of you one of these books. I, I hope you enjoy it and learn from it. Great. So if you would not mind saying your uh, name and your school and then giving us your question. Um, hello, I'm Brandon Strucker. I'm from Blue Valley Northwest High School. And my question is to Dr. Tribe, which case victory that you argued in front of the Supreme Court are you most proud of today? Thank you. Well, it's a great question, but actually the case I'm proudest of was a defeat, not a victory. Uh, in 1986, a guy named Michael Hardwick 
had been arrested for intimate activity with his boyfriend in private, perfectly consenting, and under the laws of Georgia, which was involved at the time, that was a crime. And it was a crime regardless of sex. Husband and wife could do certain things, and that was a crime too. And I thought it was a really important thing, although I knew that the composition of the court at the time made it hopeless. We could not win a claim that the Constitution prevented Georgia from outlawing certain consensual acts in private. But I also knew that we would likely get a dissent or two, and that those dissents would eventually become the law. So I lost five to four in this case called Bowers versus Hardwick in 1986, and I kept telling my students year in and year out, just wait, won't be too long before the court overrules it. It was a while, 17 years. But in Lawrence versus Texas, where I represented the ACLU, the court overruled Bowers. And in Bowers, my focus was, it didn't matter exactly what Michael Hardwick was doing in his bedroom, in private, it was nobody's business. The question was, what was Georgia doing in his bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I am proudest of that loss, although I'm pretty proud of some of the wins, too. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks. Please tell us your name and your school. I'm Katie Till from Blue Valley Northwest High School, and my question is, if the justices are capable of sharing and using their personal opinions and beliefs during cases, does this affect the constitutional validity of the decisions made? Well, you know, I don't think there's any way for a justice to avoid bringing his or her personal background to a case. Justice Scalia once said that any justice who comes to the court a blank slate and who doesn't have strong views about liberty, equality, states' rights to begin with, isn't qualified to serve on this court. That is, you can't learn about the Constitution, live an, a life, have experiences, without having opinions about what the Constitution means and how to approach it. And that, I think, is right. That's different from personal views in the sense of I'd rather see the royals win than the angels. I don't think judges should ever decide in a case based on which team they want to see win. So when John Roberts was being grilled by the Senate Judiciary Committee as to what his aspiration was, he said, I just want to go up there and be an umpire. I want to call balls and strikes. I don't want to be a pitcher or a batter. And if what he meant by that was, I don't want to have favorites, I just want to do what I think is right in terms of the Constitution, then I'm with him. But if he was trying to convey the impression that we don't have opinions, we just do the mechanical thing. You might as well replace us with good software. Uh, you know, then I think it's wrong. That is, the justices have to have opinions. And those opinions, I think, do not delegitimate the court. But when the press keeps covering it in terms of these five were appointed by Republicans, these four were Democrats, they're just voting the party line, that really, I think, misleads you. Because they don't owe, they don't owe squat to the people who appointed them. They're there for life. They're, they're, that is what assures their independence. And of course they have opinions. But unlike elected politicians who are you know, putting their finger to the wind, trying to see which way the wind is blowing because they want to get reelected, and who can blame them? Uh, these people have the degree of independence that I think makes their legitimacy much stronger than the question of what kind of world view they brought to the case. And in this book, I try to explain by looking at cases where some of the so-called liberals, like Sotomayor and Breyer, disagree, or some of the so-called conservatives, like Scalia and Alito, disagree. In fact, Alito is constantly making fun of Scalia in the opinions. Um, really hilarious opinions. But I won't, I won't spoil any of it for you by telling you what some of them are. Um, I, I think that that gives you a, a better sense of what's going on. Actu actually, uh, one famous umpire once said, you know, the strike zone is a living, breathing document. <laughs> and what he meant by that is that you, even an umpire in a baseball game has to bring judgment to bear. It's not mechanical. Great question, though. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, my name is Chancia Fairley. I'm from Leavenworth High School. 
And my question is, Dr. Tribe, I know you mentioned a few comments about privacy. Personally, where do you draw the line between personal privacy among citizens and taking precaution? Well, I think all of us need to worry when we use Twitter or Facebook or send text messages um, about who might see them. And I think that kind of precaution is important. But maybe if by precaution you mean the government has to worry about our security and our safety. It has to protect us from terrorists coming over here and doing terrible harm. And we have to balance that against our privacy. It seems to me that there's no quick answer. You know, I think both are important. I think that the safety of the nation is in some ways paramount, but we don't need to sacrifice any more privacy than necessary to secure that safety. Take the NSA's program, which has gradually emerged in some of the disclosures from Edward Snowden, a program that they initially denied existed, where basically any time you call someone on a cell phone or you go to a website, Someone in the government is aware of that. Not necessarily a human brain, but there's a big machine that's recording all of that. So in there, in the government's files, is a profile of everybody. Now, the government maintains that that's a really important thing for it to have, even though there's no reason to suspect any of you of being linked to terrorism. Because if and when such a link is discovered, that is, if somebody who we know is connected with al-Qaeda or ISIS makes a call to one of you, then they've got reason to begin looking through your stuff. And as long as we can be really assured that there aren't lots of Edward Snowdens around and that the government isn't snooping into all of your life profiles for no reason at all or maybe for political retaliation, then that does strike a good balance. But so far, the only assurance we have is the Obama administration's statement, basically, trust us. We're good guys. Well, a couple of problems. First of all, even if they are, who knows whether the next occupant of the Oval Office will be a, quote, good guy or not. And secondly, even though Barack Obama is, in my personal experience, a good guy, he was my research assistant, I like him, he's my friend, I don't trust him. That is, I don't trust the whole government bureaucracy of which he is ahead. The whole country was not built on the idea, trust us, we're good guys. It was built on the idea that human beings are not angels, that we need checks and balances, we need safeguards. And we need safeguards against the government, even when it's pursuing all of our safety. Thank you. Great question, Thanks. Jesse. Uh, my name is Brandon Wilkes, and I go to Palo High School. And I just want to know if, um, if like, I were to get my phone taken away in school and I didn't have a lock on it, could, like, the teachers legally go through it? Well, that's a great question, Brandon, and I bet there will be a case about it. Right now, I can't really answer authoritatively because the Supreme Court has said that students have rights of privacy, but that those rights are not as great as those of ordinary citizens. And it would depend very much on the circumstances. I mean, I think that there is a certain risk in bringing a smartphone to school that it will not be as invulnerable as you might like. And the Supreme Court took a position in 1979, which it may reconsider at some point. In 79, it said that when you use a telephone, or imagine that there had been smartphones around back then, whenever you use an electronic device, you're obviously not determining all by yourself who knows what number you're punching in. Somebody out there in some information service carrier or in, in an ISP or in Verizon or AT&T or uh, T-Mobile, somebody has a record of that. And the Supreme Court in 1979 said that because you are voluntarily giving to a third party a record of which numbers you're calling, You've given up all your privacy, whether you're a student or not. And therefore, the government can get immediate access to all of that. Now, from the dissenting justices in that case said that really doesn't make sense in light of an earlier case called Katz versus United States. Katz, which said that your reasonable expectations of privacy should be protected. And Justice Sotomayor 
in one of her opinions in this GPS case that we talked about earlier, uh, took the view that that decision from 1979 should be reconsidered. That just because you're giving your information to Verizon or T-Mobile or Google doesn't mean you're giving it to Big Brother. And I'm hopeful that the court will reconsider that decision. But right now, the Fourth Amendment, the privacy rights of students, like their First Amendment rights, are rather more limited than some people think they ought to be. Great question. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dorian DeBose. I am here with the Distinguished Scholars Program at Olathe North. And my question is, how was Barack Obama as a student? <laughs> <laughs> he, he was brilliant. He, first of all, I don't, you know, it's like the old birther scandal. I don't know why he didn't release his birth certificate sooner <laughs> to end the thing. I think he still hasn't released all of his transcripts from Columbia, but he did brilliantly there. At Harvard Law School, he had virtually all A's, and we grade on a blind basis. That is, when we give exams, we don't know whose person, or whose exam we're grading. Um, and as the reason I picked him as a research assistant was that he was brilliant. He was probably one of the maybe two most brilliant research assistants I've had in 45 years of teaching. So the answer is he was brilliant. Now, there are other qualities in a president that I obviously couldn't assess when he was my research assistant, and needless to say, I didn't know he'd become president. But as a student, he was brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. Also, would it bother you if I asked a second question? Uh, I don't know what the rules are, but I'm, I'm here. You can ask, sure, you can have a follow-up. Go but ahead. The, wait, there the are a lot of people behind you, so maybe okay. that wouldn't be so fair. Let's take a vote. How many behind him want him to... <laughs> <laughs> no. Why don't you get in the back of the line, and if we can, if we can stay here long enough, you then you can time. ask a second one before everyone else has had one. Thank you. But I, I see you have a career in journalism ahead of you, though. That's good. <laughs> Hi, my name is Katie Sullivan, and I'm from Blue Valley Northwest. And my question is, in September, the Paycheck Fairness Act failed in Congress for the third time since 2012, despite a growing awareness of the overall statistic that women make approximately 71 cents to every dollar that their male counterparts make. Recently, there have been a few campaigns, including he for she in the, in the United, excuse me, in the United Nations. But how do you see this issue progressing in our own government, and why? Well, I think equal pay for Katie. Thanks for the question. I think equal pay for equal work for women and men is a fundamental principle, and it's really a shame that Congress keeps resisting enacting. A, the simple Equal Pay, Equal Fairness Act. I think it's true also about sexual orientation and race um, and a, a number of other characteristics. That is, how much you earn should be a function of what kind of work you can do and not how, what your chromosomes are uh, or what your sexual orientation is. Um, I think in the future we will someday have a Congress that is more attuned with that core principle of justice, but it takes us a long time as a country to catch up. I mean, the 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which gave the vote to black males, occurred 50 years before the amendment which gave the vote to women. So we're really behind in gender, and the current Supreme Court, in terms of rights of equality, has gone further and faster in terms of sexual orientation than it has in terms of gender. So I think we've got a long way to go. I mean, finally, there are three women on the Supreme Court. Uh, there should be four and a half. <laughs> Great question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Hi, my name is Chloe O'Dell, and I'm from Eudora High School. And my question is re in regards to the presidents of a open court to the, to the public and the press. And I was wondering if you thought that it could be justified that an open public court to the press could be contradictive and counterproductive to achieving true justice. For example, the incrimination of witnesses mm -hmm. or, um, or the destruction of someone's professional life of the, of the accused. Right, it's a very, very good question. One of the things that the Sixth Amendment does is give the accused a right in a criminal prosecution to demand that the proceedings be open. 
but it doesn't give the accused the correlative right to demand that they be closed. And so at the time I argued the case of Richmond newspapers against Virginia in 1980, the state of the law was that despite the risks you talk about, if the judge rules that this proceeding should be open, despite the risks to the accused and the risks to the business interests of certain witnesses, then it's fine. But to give one government official, like a judge, the ability to decide what the public may know and what it may not know, really undercuts a core First Amendment principle of not putting the government in a position of virtual censorship. Now that said, even the decision in Richmond newspapers left open the possibility that very young witnesses or the victims of sex crimes might be able to testify in certain circumstances out of view of the public. Like a little kid might be able to testify behind a screen so that the accused can see the kid but the press doesn't get the kid's face to put on the morning news. The accused has a right to directly confront the accuser under a Supreme Court decision written by Justice Scalia under the Confrontation Clause of the Constitution, which has been incorporated against the states through the 14th Amendment. But the public doesn't automatically have a right to see everyone and everything. The real holding of the case that I won was that the public and the press cannot be excluded wholesale from a whole proceeding. But all of the interests that you mention are interests that judges do and should be allowed to balance in particular cases and in particular portions of a trial. Thank you. Thanks. We're delighted to have so many people wanting to ask questions, but I'm afraid we're only going to have time for one more question. My apologies. All right. By the way, your questions have been really great. I'm, I'm I can't tell you how pleased and impressed I am. Hi, my name is Gracie Fleming and I go to St. Teresa's Academy. And my question is, where do you see the line drawn between separation of church and state and freedom of religion? An example, um, the bar not being able to sell drinks by the church is unconstitutional, but Hobby Lobby Pass and even we have in God We Trust on governmental buildings. Well, it's a huge and wonderful question. The separation of church and state is not absolute. A lot of people say that the wall of separation is a misleading metaphor. Religious groups have a right to take part in politics. Religious groups have been among the prime movers in many of the political movements in our country, including the abolition of slavery and the ending of the Vietnam War. And there is no one place where I would draw the line. Hobby Lobby is a case where I happen to agree with the four dissenters where the corporation said that it violated their religious principles, even though they were not a church or a religious organization, but as owners of a closely held corporation without a lot of shareholders, they said that their religious principles were violated when they were made to help pay for the contraception used by some of their employees. Now, the answer that the dissenters gave is, you don't have to pay. All you have to do is make sure that the government knows that your employees will not be covered if you don't want to pay any of that part of the premium. And then the government will take care of it. But the majority of the court said that that isn't a good enough answer. And the majority, it was not really interpreting the Constitution. It was interpreting an act of Congress called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, said that the balance tips in favor of religion. And in fact, if you want just a generalization about where this court is heading on the relationship between church and state, more and more of the sort of weight is being put on the side of giving religious groups and individuals with deep religious beliefs, whether they're organized as corporations or not, the power not only to avoid doing things that violate their own religion, but to avoid complicity with their employees doing things. And there's a big pushback from within the court saying that this pendulum has swung too far. And I tend to have the view that it has swung too far, but there's no quick way of describing how far I'd like it to swing. In fact, that's a good point on which to kind of wrap this up. There, most of the really interesting constitutional questions, I doubt that this is true of the ones you're gonna get on the test. 
most of the really hard constitutional questions don't have any single right answers. It's the dialogue among the different points of view that our country conducts over the centuries that defines us as, as a democracy. We wouldn't want any automatic right answers to exist to questions where the country is deeply divided on racial, race-based affirmative action, on church and state, on abortion. Where to draw the line is a perennially shifting question. And what's fascinating about constitutional law, and the reason I'm so grateful to have had a chance to teach, teach kids about the Constitution, is that it's an unending quest. And thank you all for being part of it and being here today. to say, one of my uh, great experiences in life, whenever I get to talk to Professor Tribe for a few minutes, I always leave the conversation smarter than when I started it. And I'm sure all of you share that feeling today. So join me in thanking well, him very wait, much. Wait, wait, before, before you do, I have the same, I'm not just saying this, I have the same feeling whenever I talk to Teresa, as she is brilliant and brings the best out in everyone. So yeah. thank you all for thank being you. here. Thank you to Professor Tribe and Ms. Roseboro for an outstanding presentation, and thank you students for those terrific questions. You really teased out some important concepts for us. So just a few housekeeping items as we close up the program. For those of you who came in buses, please stay seated. Your teachers are going to tell you when it's time to dismiss so we can do it in an orderly process. You all are getting free copies of Professor Tribe's book, Uncertain Justice. And you, can, and you can thank the First Amendment Foundation for that. Um, and for teachers, there is a study guide that the First Amendment Foundation and Ken Thomas has created for you to help with <laughs> curricular materials. <laughs> and this is where you go to get the study guide and curricular materials because the bonus is that the study guide in Professor Tribe's book actually is going to help you do really well on the AP um, exam for American government. So the uh, website is www.wcfaf.org. That is the acronym for the Johnson County First Amendment Foundation. Thank you all, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.